My conversation today is with author, scholar, and translator Michael R. Osborne. Michael has translated to limited production some of the finest manuscripts available for the practitioner, collector, and academic alike, including the Most Holy Trin Sophia, The Lessons of Leon, and most recently, an updated translation of Martina de Pasquale's Treatise on the Reintegration of Beings. This seminal document is a posthumous collection of Pasquale's exegetical writings concerning the biblical events which tell the story of humankind's fall or descent into materiality. It delineates an origin story, so to speak, which would become the generative point for the doctrine of Pasquale's order of knight masons elect priests of the universe, or the Elu Cohen's in which tradition occult and philosophical luminaries such as Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin and Jean-Baptiste Villermoz were initiated and trained. Michael and I have recently collaborated in releasing his excellent translation of Pasquale's work in audiobook format, for which I have done the narration. We sat down today to talk about Pasquale, translating and recording the treatise, esoteric masonry, and much more. I'm Ike Baker, and this is the Arcanum Podcast. Well, where did your interest in translation work begin specifically? Did you, was that something you learned in, in school, in college, or? Yeah, I mean, um, my French is is compulsory in, in England, and um so we 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 learn we we're all taught it, and we, in my instance, I just continued with it a little longer into um, high school, the the equivalent of high school really, up till about the age of uh, seventeen or eighteen. Um, so my uh, I can read French quite well. Um, I I can't converse in it terribly well. I've got to say. Um, the pronunciations and 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 sort of if you like day to day sort of French, forget it. But when it comes to reading a, an old manuscript and or, or something like that, then um, I like to get stuck in. And also um, nowadays, I mean, my wife's fluent in French anyway, so she she grew up close to the Canadian border. Uh, grew up close to the Canadian border, so she's fluent in um, français canadien. Um, so she helps out. And of course, now with AI as well, um, and also just the internet research for words that don't translate easily, which there are many, as you can imagine, in these um, uh, manuscripts. It, it, it comes together eventually, but it's a labor of love. There's a lot of work involved in it, for sure. Mm. Yeah, that's that's excellent. We, we don't really have the same... Uh sort of i guess standard of uh, you know being bilingual here in the states but uh, i guess if if there were one you'd you'd probably uh most of us learn spanish take spanish in high school and things like yeah. that but i was quite interested actually recently um <clears throat> on the subject of bilingualism french in particular about the uh the community in louisiana i think about um only 50 years ago something like 25% of people there spoke French. And now it's dropped off um, to, to something like less than 50,000 or something like that. Mm. Do you have any sort of direct experience of French spoken in that state at all? Does it still no. exist? Really? I mean, you know, obviously I'm aware of sort of the Creole culture, but um, I spent, I've spent comparatively little time uh, down in Louisiana. I mean, it's, it's sort of hyper-specific to that um that particular state mm. but um i i kind of grew up somewhat bilingual um I, my my greek is not fantastic but uh i definitely you know i have greek greek speaking father and yeah. from greece and and uh the my entire family on that side speaks greek so um i i actually have um an okay time with with certain greek translations of course Obviously, you know, coin Greek, Attic Greek, it's not, I mean, it's the equivalent of, um, you know, old English or something like that. It's yeah. not, it's, it's kind of it's modern, cool. right, right, exactly. Modern Greek speakers yeah. just they scratch their heads, but it is, it is it's fairly well preserved in Greek Orthodox liturgy from what I understand. Yeah. Yeah. That's but it's interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, it is fascinating to me. People who um, just can communicate so fluidly uh, and toggle that way. I always used to ask my dad, like, what language do you dream in? And he'd be like, that's a pretty good question. I, I, yeah. I, don't, really, I don't pay attention. That, that's true fluency. I think when you can converse, um, and I think in an everyday way, actually, it's not the sort of an academic um um fluency in terms of the written word at all mm -hmm. i remember when I, I i did had to study greek at university because i did a degree in theology it was sort of compulsory greek and, and hebrew for at least for the first year anyway um and it was tortuous because of course you have to learn a new alphabet as well as as um you know the actual written words so that yeah, was quite <laughs> difficult but I, I don't regret it at all because of course it's very helpful now right um, so so it was um i'm sure this was you know uh as you as you had mentioned i'm sure this was a labor of love for you uh specifically with the treatise uh you know you can go into as much depth as as you'd like uh about what brought you specifically to the work of pasquale and um the elu cohen well <clears throat> i was thinking I, I knew you'd ask me that and i was thinking perhaps I would throw that back at you because I mean one of the reasons I chose you of course was the quality of your voice for the audio book thank you uh, it's no it's it's a stated fact you've got a really good voice um but also you have this um you have a connection as well with the the Martinist tradition um and you're an esoterically minded person so um my, I, what I'm quite keen to to discover and i know you've hinted at it in our in our text that we exchanged during this process um and it's you know it was, it was a, a demanding process actually um i'm sure reading over eight hours of the treaties in its complete well as we have it its complete form so how did what, what sort of effect or influence did it have on you as you worked through it was it the first time you'd actually um read the entire thing really in the sort of one disciplined way oh yes yes i yeah. um i had read the treatise probably about a year before you had approached me um and but it had you know it takes some time to digest because it's extremely uh particularly the translation which was available before yours was not it was difficult to parse it was very yeah. i think a lot of the language was um not the best kind that's just my my opinion um but i, I don't think i think it could have been uh translated a little bit more in a, in a way that would be easier for the common reader which oh, is what I, which i which is what i was i think you did a great job with, with that but so I I had to digest it slowly so that I could try and understand a lot of it. Some of it just hit me really hard um, on this deep interior realization level, and uh, yeah, exactly. And so then I had to like go to the park and walk it off. You know? <laughs> like think a little <laughs> bit about what was going on. I Eddie stuff. That. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. And um, <clears throat> but this particular iteration of it was the most disciplined i had been especially because i had to do people don't realize i um well you could probably hear it because i don't do a tremendous amount of editing of my podcasts um i think yeah i i probably have a really um good timbre of a voice maybe like the vocal register there it's a little lower and but my and i've worked on this for 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 many years and i think it's it's a just you know full disclosure i'm fairly open about this being in recovery i think it i think part of it has to do with years of kind of substance abuse but i have a very hard time um being fluid speaking fluidly it it, it comes mm -hmm. and goes there's a lot of stuttering and stopping and starting and man when that little red light is flashing that record button <laughs> it's like i can barely get the words out so <laughs> it, it it takes me a really long time to settle into something like a uh, I, you know, I do the, the presentation, the documentary style stuff that I do on Arcanum it takes me a long time to, to settle into that. And it took me a while to settle into the reading of the treatise. And so, uh, but there were long passages, I would say, starting in somewhere around the middle of it, where I would kind of enter this trance state and oh. just 
and just walk, mm-hmm. be walking through it, hanging, kind of clawing from one word to the next, to the next, to the next. And um, it, it was a different way of absorbing what was happening. I felt almost, um, I felt almost like I was speaking it rather than reading it. It was very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's how it should be because I mean, um, as with any form of, of, of media, I suppose art or the written word, what you're actually taking in is the, is the thought processes and the mind of somebody else. So when you're reading that or, 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 or in fact, perhaps even more so reading and speaking at the same time, um, it's like the mind of Pasquale actually speaking through you. Hmm. And I suppose if you, you know, if you contemplate that long enough, it's almost like the mind, if you like, of someone who's long dead, actually sort of for that moment, for that time where you're, you're, you're doing this, actually rearticulating itself, which is quite a fascinating idea. Hmm. For yeah, sure. it, it reminds me of what Pasquale himself describes happens to, uh, you know, Adam um, becoming a, a thinking being, where now he had these two contending voices of, you know, right and wrong, um, you know, a reintegration and and degradation, um, speaking mm-hmm. to him the whole time. And, and that is what makes man according to the treatise what he is is now yeah. he's got, yeah. you know it's it, there they're really his true voice is only expressed in his actions his choice between the you know i guess if i would put it right i'm steeped in neoplatonism the agatho diamond and the kako diamond mm. yeah and uh, i suppose if you think about the original state of man before his sort of emancipation this is in his glorious form before his emancipation um, his thoughts really essentially derive from from God, right? And and until that point where free will is actually fully exercised, and I suppose, you know, for for someone like yourself reading this as well as as um, um, actually speaking it, it's kind of like a microcosm of that process because you finished it, and I suppose after each section that you've read, it, it's it's making a small change. On, on your on your own thinking on your own thoughts and that's essentially what this is all about because the idea is to achieve clarity of thought that's exactly what martinism is about it's clarity of thought and um, having that direct if you can achieve it or improved let's say improved um, um relationship with god hmm. and did you find any of that uh to be the case while you were translating it that it was kind of uh you know altering and reshaping your thoughts i mean i'm sure you'd spent plenty of time with it before you translated it yeah i mean i think everyone's different if i'm honest um i found the the, the most holy trinisophia more powerful in that regard because i think i respond um um more particularly to images than i do perhaps to the written word and there's also this is the the age old problem people have when they translate works or, or or write commentaries on them. And this isn't a commentary, as you know, I made that quite clear. But when they translate works or write commentaries and or um, they, 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 they lose something of the mystery and the magic in what they're reading. Mm. Um, and, and I think that there's a there's a risk of that. So what I personally intend to do is actually um, read it afresh. And what I'm doing, of course, with your particular translation is I'm doing that at the same time as I'm listening to it. And mm. it's all there's there's a belief um, um, that Pasquale actually, um, um, well, he did almost certainly dictate this work to his secretaries. Ah, okay. Yes, I, I had heard... Um just from various sources and on the internet and speaking to some people that um, <clears throat> he, he wasn't uh, fully, I guess, literate in French, right. Being from, from Spain. Spoken. Yeah. So again, it's a second language. It's a third language possibly uh, for Pasquale. And we don't know too much about his origins. I suspect yeah. probably converso Portuguese. I mean, in, I don't know if you read the introduction to the Fournier 
treaties i think you probably have um there were around about 100 um excuse me it's the book falling over there are about 100 um jewish portuguese jewish families living in bordeaux at the time and they're all centered around the harbor and trade mm. now 100 families is actually quite a lot of people in 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 real terms um, so it should come as no surprise then when we see the name Martinez de Pasquale, perhaps his father, um, perhaps the man himself, I don't know, turning up in um, in lodges in, in Dublin, for instance, and elsewhere, um, because um, of the trade. And I think that perhaps, you know, the family um, were originally Jewish, they were Portuguese. Um, I think you may be able to correct me but there was um, a portuguese um, inquisition in the early 18th century so it kind of ties in with the arrival of the family perhaps in in bordeaux around that sort of time um as a trading family so he would have been multilingual um almost certainly um and who knows perhaps he even spoke english i mean he did attend we believe the dublin law a, d a lodge in dublin so um it's likely that he did which is quite an, a, an exciting thought for me, actually, that Pasquale would would speak English, actually. Yeah, yeah, it, it, that, that's the great yeah. kind of like what you're saying about commentaries on translations before you remove some of the magic and the mystery. I always fall in love with these characters that I, I it's just impossible really to know anything conclusive about, you know, <laughs> like like Pasquale. I mean, it's uh, that to me, the history of his life is something that I would I mean, I would I, I would love to see more information come to to light. I mean, is there in your researches? I mean, it sounds of necessity you would have you know you, you've probably uh done plenty of research on pasquale and the treatise and and martinism martinezism but um i'm wondering if there is any evidence that points to him being a part of some pre-existing group maybe outside of of masonry uh, where he would have gotten some of this material from i mean do you believe it to be more revelatory where where do you think he was getting this stuff in the treatise what's your what's your opinion well i mean um his theurgy comes from agrippa um so and agrippa as you know was the christian theurgist trying to reconcile um a, a world of, of miracles and spirituality with the the everyday sort of essentially sort of material chaos we live in the ordinary world mm -hmm. so he's a sort of precursor to someone trying to tackle atheism and things of that nature and he sees in magic um, a means to actually demonstrate that well Pasquale turns to theurgy just on that particular stream of thought of may at the moment he turns to theurgy essentially um, because it's the only thing that he can find available to him which will achieve the end so he wouldn't have regarded himself as a priori a theurgist he is a christian mystic specifically a catholic christian mystic mm. um who is using the the grimoires devised by agrippa um to essentially then clarify the thought process because you can't think independently pasquale is repeatedly saying all our thoughts are being influenced by other entities that are swirling around us in their millions and billions they're infiltrating our mind and that of course is what leads to such things as, as addiction and 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 other things because of the influence that's coming through now that's not to take away all, all excuse but it's to say essentially man's in a mess we are this is our human condition and in order to to um uh, relieve ourselves of, of of these malignant forces and influences in our thoughts because we're like an open sponge essentially for all these things is to have the protection of a higher being a guardian and the only way you can obviously um, approach that guardian, understand and let them work for you is to dispel um, the, the evil influences from you and to have their help in doing it. So theurgy is a tool in the kit. It's merely a working tool. It's a plumb rule. It's a, it's, it's any of the other Masonic implements you want to use. So there it is. Um, and yes, so he's essentially, um, 
using that, but he does speak to answer your question specifically. Um, other than the the provenance of what, he's, of what he's drawing on, he does speak actually about coming from an anterior order. He says this to Fournier. Mm. Okay, so it's something that Pasquale says that, and, and I think also in some of his letters as well um, to the um, Roquois, he's saying that um, um, I, I come from a Rosicrucian background. He turns up in any event with a patent his father had given him to establish lodges. And of course, Pasquale, again, he uses Freemasonry to uh, recruit essentially high quality candidates into his order. Because his belief is that to influence society, uh, to make that that change in it, to eliminate evil as fully as possible, you've got to start from the top down. Um, and this is where he's going with it. And of course, then he starts to recruit army officers and the like. Now, whether he is from an interior order, nobody exactly knows. Um, he, I believe as was Fournier, definitely was, but I believe Pasquale was influenced by Swedenborg, for instance. Um, and so, um, you know, they're, they're, and they may even have met because they were in the same cities at, at certain occasions, almost certainly, I'm sure of it. Um, so um, particularly London and, and the like, no evidence Pasquale was there, but he almost certainly would have visited it when he was trading with his family. So anterior orders, yeah, quite likely. Rosicrucian, why not? I mean, um, that's exactly um, what what could be the case. We do know he converted to Christianity, for instance. So someone's having it, or perhaps his father did, but someone's having an influence on the family. And an interesting point, actually, about um, the Dublin Lodge in particular, this is um, uh, Lodge 26 in Dublin, was that um, Pasquale's accompanied by a brother, another Pasquale. OK, unless it's his father, of course. So, you know, in which case um, you've probably got a family. And we know, don't we, from um, Sander Ming that his cousin as Cassas and, and, and others were interested. So we could be dealing with an esoteric family of the Levitical class originally, perhaps. Which is another point, because, of course, he's trying to reestablish alongside the living exoteric church, a secret church, um, a, a, an order almost of Old Testament priests to try and bring this second coming closer. And then finally reconciling Israel, the old Israel with the new. Wow, that's um, I, I, it's just outstanding. It's mind blowing. I, I get um, I, I'm very much. I, I would say sympathetic to the work that I've seen, you know, obviously um, of of the Elu Cohen and, and and his writings. But it's it's been very interesting to me. Uh, I had really gotten into a uh, a Gnostic sort of, uh, I would say, classical. You know, if there is such a thing, um, yeah. much more of the historic background and Valentinian and, and Basilidian. Sethian Gnosticism, studying that stuff and beginning to uh, interpret scripture through some of uh, those viewpoints. <clears throat> and I had a similar experience as when I read the treatise, you know, things that were perpetually obscure, all of a sudden, you know, light had been thrown on them. And it was, it, it's not that, it's not that I reorganized my perception or, or reorganized the facts to fit. It's that Things that were, um, I guess, in, uh, perceptive interfaces that had been installed, yeah, were were obscuring my ability to see what was actually there, and um, not always and, the way, yeah. Right. And and the thing that was incredible to me is having just really gone through, um, you know, uh the secret book of John and the hypotheses of the archons. And then reading the, the trait, you know, just maybe like eight months to a year later, it, it was astounding to me how much it, it, there was a, a Gnostic interpretation to that history. So much of it was, was very, very similar. And so that's why my thought was, where was he getting this history from? Right. Because it's not, that's not Orthodox history, you know, small well, Orthodox. Well, yes and no. Um, He's not a Gnostic. He's a Catholic Christian. But the thing is, 
that true you know the, the the truth about the origins of life and the creation of the universe um it, it, it's 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 often best described using that sort of terminology and i think that's sometimes where the confusion arises so he's not a gnostic because um um, Adam didn't steal God's powers. He was fully given them. He took part in creation after it had already started. Mm. And then it was God who cast him into his material form as a punishment. So that is that is a significant departure from classical Gnosticism. But of course, when you, you, you read um, the treaties and some of the other, um, particularly modern Elu Cohen works, um, you do pick up on what appears to be um, a strong sort of Gnostic stream. But the reality is, I think what Martinez de Pasquale is actually describing to us was a state before creation. Now, the Bible doesn't even go there. Right. So he's talking, isn't he, about the beginning, the, you know, before creation. So this is a whole new area. Um, so it's easy to attach Gnostic um, um epithets or or, or um uh, interpretations to it mm -hmm. but it's actually something incredibly new and the church doesn't go there either because the church is all about the obviously the incarnation event and the messianic messianic age and the second coming well Pasquale is all about that too the incarnations at the midpoint of history but to understand why the messianic age isn't what it was meant to be um you've got to understand the very beginning and man's place in the universe and what went wrong and the bible barely touches it a chapter at the beginning of genesis the first two chapters essentially it and while pasquale wants to get down into the into the nitty-gritty and tell you that there's evil demons and other entities and disembodied human souls of ill intent that are going to influence your thoughts and block you from god Yes, and that's that to me was the the tr the tr the real revelation of of um of the treatise and certain form certain forms or or and certain perspectives within within Gnosticism was that um but it's also there I'm I'm a lifelong Catholic as well uh but okay. uh, I uh, it's also there in Catholicism as well it's like it is like yeah in, but it's like not it's not celebrated and right. it is encouraged because of the authority issues right this this yeah. kind of this this viewing this viewing of the material realm as um almost as an underworld you know i know we we think about it in terms of exile but then there's this element of it right that that and and this is very very important now now that magic and and goetic magic and evocation is so popular right in the yep. mainstream is that you are yep. dealing with forces little or completely unsuspected and you are at a massive disadvantage because they on the other side of that veil there is no guarantee that they will pr produce to you any form that is truly indicative of their nature it is yeah. just as easy for them to lie as it is it's easier because we can't see their their true form uh you know whenever we want so that was very that was very powerful to me when i got into the theurgy yeah. of the elu cohen yeah you're quite right and of course the the the, the church um um while it has its sacramental ministry we know about the seven sacraments and the like it doesn't properly engage with evil in the way that it perhaps should the way it did in its early days so it was quite normal for the apostles and for um the, the other followers of christ in the first generation or two to actually engage in exorcism and engage in in spiritual warfare and combat um but the church doesn't like that because it encourages it encourages mysticism in people, encourages inquiry. And the problem with that, of course, it can also lead to personal religion, which leads to error and confusion and possession and God knows what else. Um, so it likes to control what's going on and it therefore is then alienated itself from the spiritual core, which is why Pasquale and he would say, um, whether there was an antecedent order he said there was but regardless he's saying all the way from the time of noah there's within the order of secret um of 
um, priests, select secret priests that have been doing just that, preparing the way for Christ's incarnation. And now they're fighting the war in readiness for his second coming. And the best example from the scriptures is when Jesus sends out 72 disciples ahead of him into Galilee. He only sends them there. Now, he's going to head into Galilee, of course, and um, deal with the um, various things that are going on there. One of which, Samaria, was known, re reputedly known in ancient um, Israel as a place where demonic forces were particularly strong and particularly prevalent. It was a dangerous area for some reason or another. Of course, it's also where Simon Magus came from. OK, um, the chap that tried to buy the apostles power. Simony, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was Simon, exactly. And um, it's named after him. Um, and he's quite an interesting character. But so the 72 are sent ahead and they're sent in pairs. Um, there has to be a good reason why they're sent in pairs. Well, clearly, because you need someone there to keep watch over to be the spotter for the guy that's doing the actual theurgy, the actual exorcism, which is exactly what exorcism is. Along with the sacraments, they're magic. Sacraments are just that. So um, the idea was to actually cleanse the area before Christ could get there so that he could communicate more clearly with the Father and do that work while he's there of healing and cleansing and casting out demons. And with Jesus, it's there's more casting out miracles and with the apostles as well than there are healing so you've got it's it's a very important part of his ministry to do the healing in a spiritual and a physical way and part of that is casting out these things which they um fervently believed in so did pasquale and you can see why that he believed there was a need for this secret society and the other thing about pasquale and the original elo cohen is that they were soldiers in the main part mm. And even if they weren't, they were nobility. So these were men joined with principle. Um, many of them had actually fought physical uh, warfare. Um, Pasquale's regiment itself um, was engaged um, in um, combat in the, in the Low Countries and in Germany. Um, his regiment refused to surrender when the orders came through from the French to do so, from their government to surrender to the Prussians and um to the Germans and they refused to do it so they held out they didn't like the terms so they were quite brave men and his regiment also um, saw service in the Caribbean and also in the American War of Independence wow. so they were involved in raids on um, on the on the southern states wow so then so then he would have he would have been on American soil at that point. oh but you don't know that I mean he he may have been um, quartered in France for all of the action but um he may well have taken part that I don't know, but I do know that um, others such as uh, de Granville, Lieutenant Colonel and others and San Martin, they were also um, cavalry officers. That's how they met. That's how they were recruited. So a lot of these uh, um, Cohen would have been um, men with, with experience sort of soldiery. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, that is a key feature of, of, I think solid theurgy is that um, strong martial characteristic you know um the, within the operator the ability to to uh you know embody that that warrior force yeah yeah exactly um that's exactly it's the knightly thing of course there's only part of the story shiver is an essential part of um knightly identity and of course this is where the nobleman joining the order would have stood I mean, de Granville, uh, for instance, I mean, he was actually um, guillotined in by the revolutionaries. So he didn't flee France. He met, he stood up and, and was counted. Wow. <laughs> yeah. wow. Uh, so it's, it's amazing, you know, um, how much of the esoteric history and, you know, exoteric history just, um, inform one another and the 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 question another question that i i really wanted to ask you was from your perspective um you've covered a lot of ground particularly on your works on uh sort of esoteric societies and philosophies you know um how have you seen or have you seen um the treatise really influencing 
uh, the magical societies or, or what have you, theurgic occult societies that came after it. Uh, do, do you find there to be um, a connection? I mean, obviously there's, you know, uh, Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin, but... Well, you know, the, the, the coven disbanded in, in 1780. Um, if it survived at all, if there's any sort of succession that it would have been through the CBCS um, established by Villemus, who never really fully abandoned it, and neither did Fournier, although, of course, Fournier was booted out of France because he was a, a priest, um, and he he would have rejected the state, um, you know, the new state deist religion and and that kind of thing, and he was tonsured as well, so he would have stood out quite. <laughs> okay, so, um, and he didn't want to grow that out. Uh, so, um, you know, as far as that's concerned, yeah, I mean, you you, you can't have one w without the other, really. This this exoteric and esoteric, they do sort of coexist in 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 tandem. Yeah, it's. Uh, I was actually. Um, it's just interesting. I was reading something. Well, I put together this presentation on on uh, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, and one of the interesting points of of cross section. There is that obviously the Golden Dawn comes out of or uh, claims to come out of the, I would say, 18th century German uh, Masonic Rosicrucian sort of uh, fraternities. You know, there, there's the, the Golden Rosenkreuzer and uh, SRIA that, that it kind of borrowed the grade system from. But... At a certain point, uh, Mathers makes a reference to the harmony with which the Martinists and the Rosicrucians, um, you know, can operate uh, together. And I do, I do, or I have read, I don't know, but I have read that um, Papu or Papus had uh, joined Mathers' uh, Alpha at Omega in the early 1900s when they were in Paris and that Mathers actually joined his Martinist order. So there was a lot of interesting inter in, interplay there. And, and obviously when the, the inner order of the golden dawn gets formed and I think formed in 1891, um, you know, the, the, the stated purpose for it is theurgy. Yeah. And of course the stated purpose of the yellow coin, the original yellow coin, was anything but. It just happened to be, as Pasquale once told Saint Martin, it just happens to be we use what we have in wow. order to achieve those stated ends. So um, there's a big difference. And I think that my own personal view is that the modern yellow coin, the Amberlane stream, uh, with its um, uh, provenance and Pappas and the, and, uh, and the like, um, doesn't really reflect what the original Elu Cohen were like at all. And if you look at the original um, uh, manuscripts, particularly the, the theurgy they're using, such as the manuscript of Algiers, for instance, mm -hmm. it's very different indeed from from what Amberlain was was doing. He sort of tended to grab the sort of the um, lesser keys of Solomon and things like that, and he sort of had very much a focus on 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 theurgy, but not the type of theurgy that Pasquale was was drawing on and Pasquale also edited very heavily edited what he was using um, and limited its use in a very strong way so um, uh, what's often missed and I think that the following the very strict almost monastic lifestyle or discipline that the original Elo Cohen had again as soldiers and as noblemen um, was th was this idea that you actually have to recite the holy offices on on an almost daily basis, and and, and so you're perpetually um, cleansing yourself in readiness um, for the theurgy that you will undertake at some point um, during the, one of the four principal times of the year that were set aside by Pasquale for that and of course if you've read the treaties you know and you've read it and loud um, Moses talks about his four quaternary um, um, operations and so this is essentially what it's about like I say it's going back to having um, a secret Old Testament style priesthood running alongside the exoteric church because you can't have 
um, the exoteric on its own. You need the esoteric. The exoteric church has got its work. It's also doing esoteric work through the sacraments, um, but it's not doing everything it should be. Um, and so therefore you have an esoteric church secretly running alongside it that's doing um, those things too, um, so specifically exorcism. Wonderful. Uh, on the topic of, of this theurgy and its evolutions, obviously we understand uh, Saint Martin sort of broke away from the Elu Cohen to pursue what he ended up calling the way of the heart. Um, is is there any evidence that you've seen that he continued to undertake or engage in a kind of theurgic practice that was based uh, on what he had learned, or did he just kind of um, abandon the the operative for the the mystical? Well, I don't know about Saint Martin, but Fournier, the Abbe Fournier, is an interesting case. Mm. Uh, he wrote two volumes of his treatise, and only one survives. He chose, I suspect, never to publish the second one. We know it survives because there's a reference made to it. Okay, and he frequently talks about it in his treaties as well. So I think it probably was completed. And who knows, maybe one day it'll be discovered in manuscript form somewhere, ready for someone to publish. But I suspect not. Now, um, Fournier is professedly influenced by um, Jacob Boehmer, Madame Gurion, uh, and particularly Swedenborg. So he's interested in this vitalism that was going on in the 18th century. And he's a spiritual scientist, really, if you like, is the way to look at it. And um, all of that um, is essentially saying that that within um, the material world, there's a spiritual existence that can eventually be proved scientifically in, in, in the way you can eventually prove God. You can eventually... Um, uh, proved spirit now fournier there he is in his rooms um in london he only lived in two or three in his um during his um um years in exile living with british diplomats in the french section of london and he is um having um, experiences of communication he says sometimes on a daily often more than once a day um communications with pasquale and other people uh, such as his parents and quite interestingly um, a being he describes as neither male nor female which was not human okay so we have there um i suspect his, it's him saying between the lines it's his guardian right right okay and pasquale is there as well to continue mentoring him and and um and keeping a look over him i suppose but here's the thing the whole of the first treatise is a Fournier setting down a Christian apologetic. He's saying, you know, don't abandon the apostolic church, um, um, acknowledge its authority. But at the same time, he's then also saying that he met Martinez de Pasquale, and although he was unsure of him at first because he was mistrusting of anyone that would use the urge and, uh, and was... Um, in a secret society the church we know don't like those okay um they'll tolerate them as long as you don't go on about them and talk about them okay so um in the second volume the one we don't have the second part of the treaties i strongly suspect because this is where the end of his treaties is leading when he gives a biography of himself and his meetings with pasquale i suspect it's leading into what he actually did as an Elu Cohen and what he continued doing as an Elu Cohen, because if he's having these seances for want of a better word, I suspect probably that isn't the case. He's actually uh, performing some sort of ritual um, in his rooms. That's my gut instinct. As for Sam Matan, well, I mean, he sold out in a way because it was too much like hard work um, to, to, to encounter. Well, it's true to encounter the spirit of Christ. I mean, if you're going to sort of like go all out to sort of um, get into contact with the shows, then you've really got to put the work in and deserve it. I and mean, it was a bit too much hard work for Saint Martin. So Bohemond, the quietism, 
um, was something that, um, that I suspect he probably turned to lock, stock and barrel because we call it Martinism. Uh, but essentially that's uh, the legacy of Pappas. That's uh, right. Yeah. And Martinism on the other hand of the original Cohen, which is why we must read original sources like the lessons of Leon and the treaties and the Abbe's um, um, treaties and things like the manuscript of Algiers um, and, and, and so on, that those sorts of materials. Um, the reason we need to do that is because we need to recognise that original Martinism was a mystic Catholic movement within a Masonic framework that happened to be using theurgy because it served its purpose. So it's nowadays it's the cart leading the horse. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And what's interesting to me is I, uh, I have kind of heard it referred to as, um, you know, a, a sort of tr true form of masonry. Do you think that, um, that that is what they, what, what Pasquale in particular believed the Elu Cohen to be doing sort of rectifying the original purpose for masonry or, no, I think probably someone like Cagliostro was trying to reform it with his Egyptian rites and things like that. Right. I think that was a genuine attempt. And he's a much maligned and misunderstood man. I mean, they did a real hatchet job on him. <laughs> and they would have done on Martinez if he'd have if he'd put his head above the parapet. But of course, that wasn't what he was about. Right. Uh, so attractive about the early yellow cohen is this idea that you can be a mystic and an esoteric and a theurgist whilst also remaining true and loyal to your your christian faith and i think that's a very beautiful position Cagliostro, on the other hand um you know he 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 stuck his head above the parapet mm. and uh and he, you know he got caught by the inquisition and they locked him away until he died and that's the unfortunate part of that um so no i don't think that um the theurgy is the is the is the core part of what's going on i think it's necessary and i think pasquale if he was here would say if you could find a better way of of um creating the, the barriers that we need to block out evil and and to receive the influence of good then i'm all up for it and that's my time I think he knew that, and I, I think he, you know, he, he wouldn't have had any regrets because Pasquale would probably have agreed it's not for you. Follow the quietest path if you must, but if you're going to help other people, if you're going to make a difference in other people's lives, quietism isn't going to do it. Right. Absolutely. Oh man, <laughs> that is such an important point, yeah. um, especially right now. <laughs> I wanted to. Um... Coming towards the end of the of our conversation today, although I I sincerely hope it's the first of many, because uh you know I feel like you are a um just an incredible font of of knowledge and and context. It's wonderful to speak with you on on things you're so clearly passionate about. But uh, you have a new book. Um, has that come out yet? The time slip phenomena uh book or? Yeah, it's available. Um, paperback and Kindle. Um, we have to have a break sometimes from the really heavy stuff, don't we? And my idea was to um, write essentially about the connection between ghosts and um, people that are alleged to have time slip um, experiences, such as glimpses into the past and future. Mm. Um, what's a ghost? What's a time slip? And I was talking to a cousin the other day. I have never met him before, by the way. We only met via sort of 23 and me and he's like a first cousin twice removed but it's great that because you can get a load of pictures and photos and family history i don't know if you've done it but i love I have, cousins. I have, yeah. it's great yeah anyway but he was he 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 said he, i handed him my book as a sort of gift and he said oh i had an experience of seeing the future well i was very interested in that because most time slips that we know of tend to be into the past and of course he didn't know what the content of my book was actually about but essentially when he was young he was given a job um when he was an apprentice um engineer he was given the job of taking the bets from his work colleagues superiors if you like to the bookies um to to place their bets on horses well he did this for some time and on one occasion he went in and way before the results were meant to be and there they were written on a board 
the horse that came in first, second and third was on the board already. You know what's coming. So <laughs> he wrote it down, took it back. And and then um, the, the blokes he was working with said, well, the horses haven't run yet. Oh, I'm listening to it on the radio, mate. They haven't run. And then one of them said to him, take this. This was back in the 70s. He said, take this £10, which is worth a lot of money, and put it on that horse you said was going to win. Well, he did, and he put some on for himself, and they won big time because when he went back in there, there was nothing written on the board, and he actually stood there as they wrote on it um, in exactly the way, including a slip someone had made in in their writing. That's oh, incredible. Oh, no. So, like, these are everyday, everyday instances. But, of course, the re the reality is, like, time is a creative, is a, oh, sorry, a part of creation, you see. So it doesn't follow necessarily these rules and regulations that we like to think as a controlling animal um you know we like to control everything don't we well we mm. can't we control precious little and time is certainly one of those things so i wanted to do that and of course what's the difference essentially between someone that exists in the future or someone that exists in the past if they're not in the present they're a ghost aren't they so it's kind of like what what is that and i you know i I ended up I ended up with a heavy book. Um, unfortunately, I wanted to write a light one, um, <laughs> despite everything. Um, and I'm I'm going into um, Platonism, of course, because you know the, the great truths are you know essentially there. Well, they were always way back. Um, these things don't change. And um, the idea essentially is that the mind um, operates in some way unproved on a quantum level so scientists will tell us that the the electrical sparks and neurons in the brain don't travel anywhere near as fast as the speed of light let alone faster but i suspect probably that's because we can't scientifically measure quite what it can do yet mm. and this takes us back quite interestingly to the old martinez point about the influences of of deceased minds and and evil spirits and good spirits for that matter angels and the like on through the mind well of course if it's streaming through almost like a force of dark matter but perhaps in another form then it may influence all sorts of things and it's the mind that lived in the past present and future it explains a whole raft of phenomena such as reincarnation and and all sorts of things um and those feelings of deja vu we have as well mm which are always very strange. And I give some examples of my own life, but I also talk about some quite famous ones like the, um, the, the ghosts at the Battle of Sharpsburg, which people can still hear and, and things of that nature. Right. And there's battlefields here as well. And it's not always um, noises or sounds or visions. Actually, sometimes these things interact with people. Uh, and that's what interested me the most. Like how can a mind that, is dead if it's just a record built into the ether and the fabric of time how can it actually communicate with the living and we know um if you if you watch good ghosted shows like ghost adventures where they actually take these things seriously and not just out to make a buck you realize actually that sometimes they are getting some intelligent responses from these discarnate forms or existences but what are they I mean, in the West, we tend to think of them as perhaps um, um, ghosts in the Islamic world. They'd be jinn. They'd be evil spirits trying to deceive people. But either way, all these cultures believe in them. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's actually much more of the, I, I would say, the lineage through which I was sort of brought up to interact with, with things like this is that it's essentially a a husk that um potentially when it when intelligent um the, the first sort of uh thing that comes to my mind is like okay um something might be uh appropriating this and you know that that kind of deceptive yeah. that deceptive nature wearing the etheric yeah. for lack of a better term wearing the etheric remnant as uh this you know motivated exactly yes, exactly exactly yeah. exactly yeah the shade and some bloke made some really really good comments on my um time slip facebook page about shades actually let's just have a look at it very quickly if you've got a moment 
Sure, yeah, um, absolutely. And I'll just quote what he what he said because I was talking about the sort of the platonic, um, um, the, the tripartite um, nature of the mind, uh, reason, emotion, and then um, need or necessity that that kind of thing, um, and and they equate essentially to the soul, spirit, and um, astral forms. And of course, we've got the fourth, which is the um, um, uh, yeah, the, the general physical form that we have, which is what we leave behind. But I think the astral form continues on for a while and eventually dissolves or gets sort of reintegrated into another greater astral form. But the mind, as the pure thinking mind, as Plato said, would then continue. This also fits in what Rudolf Steiner was saying as well. Mm. But anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a fella, his, his name on... Um, time slip phenomena is Jebediah Morningside and he says this in response to my post he says well such shades uh, were still considered valuable to call upon in many traditions worldwide in order to get residual information it appears that they can still be called upon by others who connect to them enough this reminds me of when Carl Jung mentioned about how archetypal archetypes gods come alive again when true discipline is applied but I can't remember the exact quote, though I remember that the occultist Israel Ragadi had placed the quote at the beginning of his original editions of either his book, True Healing or The Middle Pillar. That's quite profound, um, I think, um, to actually believe that ghosts might be the, the um, etheric resonance of what the ancients would have understood as shades. And of course, that then makes perfect sense mm. with the Hebrew concept of shawl. Right. Yes. Meetings as well. You know. So, yeah, it's 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 good stuff. Fantastic. I mean, I'm looking forward to to reading that. Believe it or not, um, in between, you know, source materials and commentaries and translations, uh, I, that's the kind of you know stuff I like to read. You know. Um, well, perhaps you should. Um, perhaps we should do an audio book. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, so. Is there anything else that you've got going on or or anything that you want to uh, make the listeners of this conversation uh, aware of? Yeah, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm always, always active. Um, and so um, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm just about finishing the uh, republication of all of the hardbacks, uh, the three Elo Cohen books and the Trina Sophia as um, digital um cloth covered with dust jackets and the Trina Sophia is going to be um, released as a six by nine um, digital um, cloth cover with a with a jacket as well because a lot of people have come to me and have said um, love the books but we, we collect them and we, we like we like to have the the hardbacks with a dust jacket on and so they'll look quite nice and so that's a small labor of love I've, I've done it recently i've just got the lessons of leon to sign off on that and then all four of those will be there and then the other thing i'm working on at the moment with um, collaborators is um, a fourth elo cohen um, translation which will be coming out to add to the other three um, in the not too distant future, and that's focusing much more on the on the theurgy than um, the theology. Fantastic! Uh, I'm sure everybody's going to be looking forward to that. Uh, I appreciate you, uh, Michael R. Osborne, for taking time out of your day to speak with me, and um, I'm looking forward to speaking with you again. So thanks for being on. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.